We're talking today to Professor Rana Mitta, who is the director of the University of Oxford's China Centre. And Rana, my understanding is that your spe- study of China is huge, isn't it? But your speciality has been the study of recent Chinese history, running from about nineteen. 19- 19, so nearly a hundred years ago. Can you start by telling us why it's important to understand the events, particularly from 1919, in order to understand modern China? Dennis, I'm very glad you asked that question because one of the convictions I've had over my time as a historian, particularly here at Oxford, is to have people understand that the China we see today ruled by a communist party in name, although actually a rather capitalist society in in reality. Anyone who's been to China will know what I'm I'm talking about. Of course, owes its immediate presence to many of the the most important leaders, for good or ill, that we've had in the last few decades. So names like Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and most recently Xi Jinping. Now, these are the names that perhaps you tend to know if you know a little bit about Chinese history. But I really feel that some of the events that come before they even got to power, before the Communist Revolution of 1949, are really very important in changing China's path and getting us to where we actually are today. So, two quick examples. 1919, you mentioned. That's the year that everyone in China who's had even a high school education will know about, and almost no one in the West has ever heard of, because it was the year of something called the May 4th Movement. May 4th, 1919. A moment when students, young students, demonstrated in, in the centre of Beijing against what they saw as the weakness of their own government. And as part of that, they helped to form a wider movement which became both a cultural and a political renaissance, you might say, in, in China. Now, the Chinese Communist Party was part of that, but it wasn't just them. It was also a whole variety of artists, writers and others who came from that. So. That 1919 moment is, in a sense, one of a kind of earlier cultural revolution, not in Chairman Mao's sense, but I think in a more genuine flowering. Uh, uh, Yes. And was that, to some extent, a reaction to the feeling that China was, as it were, somehow um, subdued by other countries? Well, they had a more colourful expression, actually, Dennis, for it, which I'll, I'll give you. At the time, the expression that many young Chinese used was that China was being, and I quote here, carved up like a melon. Yes. This is, you know, a real expression of, it sounds almost amusing, but actually it was really an expression of anguish on their part, yes. that China, like many other countries, they, they, knew, they knew it hadn't been colonised like India. It wasn't quite that situation, yeah, right. but it was a situation where the outside powers, the British, the French, the Japanese, were essentially able to do what they wanted on China's territory. And this stimulated a great deal of Chinese nationalism. But thinking about that also just reminds me of the other one moment that I want to bring up. And I say moment, really, actually, it's it's, it's a stretch of, of eight years. 1937 to 1945, the years of the Second World War in China, devastating con- conflict with eight, ten, maybe more million Chinese killed during those years, the destruction really of the very painful modernization that China had seen during that time, the creation of a refugee crisis which saw 80 to 100 million Chinese becoming refugees in their own country. Now, you could go down the street here in Oxford and perhaps find very few people who know anything about China's role during that Second World War, even the fact that they were an ally of of our own country, the UK and of, of the US. And yet, of course, that titanic war was one of the other huge events that helped to shape the modern China today. And looking at those sorts of events before the communists actually take hold, I think helps us to understand the communist era even better. Certainly, for somebody like me as a scientist who visits China frequently, I find the nationalism is very, very interesting because it's strong And it doesn't seem to be just attached to the present communist regime, does it? It's, 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 as you say, a feeling that has grown out of the history. You're absolutely right. And there's a positive as well as a negative attitude towards uh, um, an element of it. On the one hand, I think there is, in China, perhaps more than anywhere else, uh, certainly more than in Britain, 
a real knowledge of much of China's history and a way that that past informs the present. That can be unhealthy at times. Sometimes it's a little disturbing to hear, you know, young students in their 20s express a hatred of the Japanese, which I think is based on things that happened 70 years ago and, and, and not recently. On the other hand, you talk about, as a scientist, visiting China. Now, I'm sure you've visited some of the great universities like Tsinghua Indeed. or Peking University, Indeed. Beida, in, yes. in Beijing. Well, these, of course, are institutions of the late Qing dynasty and the Republic. And one of the things I find very heartening is that those institutions have gone back to their history before Mao, before 1949, and said that, yes, of course, we have thrived under the current government, but let's be honest, we also are, owe our intellectual origins, including that, in, uh, that uh, stress on science, yes. the desire to investigate and, and modernize China through science from that earlier period. And I think bringing that sort of scientific past into the present has been very productive. Yes, yes, right. Now I want to fast forward to the present day. Uh, it's a big jump, I know, but you've explained, I think, very clearly how understanding that period before the communist uh, regime um, makes a big difference to our understanding of China's mentality and attitudes. Now, I think we could both agree that 2016 was a pretty watershed year, <laughs> certainly, changes, certainly yes. for the West, with uh, events in Europe, uh, here in Britain, and in America that uh, were not expected, we have to say that, and which, well, we don't yet know what the consequences c can be. But this leaves a lot of people, and I think a lot of people watching this program um, will be interested in the following question. Puts China in a rather extraordinary role. It's almost one of the elements of stability in it the is, world. Now, is, am yes. I right? Or is that a... There's something to that, Dennis. I mean, in fact, just a few weeks ago, as we, we speak here, um, there was something of another watershed, which was the appearance of uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, at Davos, at the, Davos, the World Economic, exactly Forum. Great economic Forum. Now, the idea that the leader yes. of the world's largest communist party would yes. be getting up and talking in favor of globalization, uh, free trade, yes. markets, you know, is something that it, I'm, Chairman Mao is probably spinning in his mausoleum e yes. even yes. now. Yes. But actually what it indicated was that China has actually, in many ways, not all, but in many ways, been significantly socialized into international society yes. and does have a role as one of the poles, not the only pole, but one of the poles of international order. Now, right. we're just a couple of weeks into the presidency of, of Donald Trump. We don't know yet quite how the US will be different yes. in its international behavior under him. Things may, may change over time. But it's certainly clear that China at the moment, I think, has no short-term interest in a very radical rupture in world order, you know, to disrupt world trade apart from anything else. It also, I think, has no interest in one of the areas where there are fears that the US might try and push back, and that's in climate change. The China, Chinese were very instrumental. They've taken it on. They? Well, they were pushing, you know, along with others, along with India, and along with Barack Obama's administration and the EU, did come to this very important agreement in Paris just, you know, 18 months ago, and slightly less than that even, um, if, if it appears that the United States is going to try and pull out of that unilaterally, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that China actually ends up with the EU, with India, with Japan, with other countries actually saying, well, look, in, on this, it's America that's the outlier, and actually China's in the mainstream. In addition to wondering about the relationship that China's going to have to the new situation is developing in Europe and in the United States, there's also the question of the knock-on effects in relation to some very unstable situations in Korea and Japan. How do you see um, China's relation to the other countries in East Asia, with which, of course, it's got to form good relations, and given a, a history that has been pretty terrible? I think that you're right that China plays an important role in creating stability in both North and Southeast Asia. I would also say that I think China's at what you might call a sort of pivot point of its own at the moment, because its behavior at the moment pushes in two different directions. One of them could be extraordinarily productive for the, reason, for the region. One could potentially be um, disruptive, 
So let's get the disruption over first. Right. Many people are concerned by the way in which, in particular, in the South China Sea, through building up uh, claims to maritime power in areas that are internationally disputed, through creating facts on the water rather than actually yeah. using international law, that China's taking a path that may not actually be that, that much of an advantage to China itself in the end, since everyone has an interest in free navigation in a very, very commercially important part of the, the world. So we hope that China will perhaps turn from the boats to the courts, so to speak. That's probably a better place to thrash these things out. And it would be advised to do so because actually one of its other stated aspirations is to create a whole area of economic integration, not just in Asia, but into Central Asia and even as far as Europe, the so-called um, One Belt, One Road policy, the New Silk Road, New Silk, Maritime yes. Silk Road. Right. Now, it's a very, very ambitious plan, but if there is any prospect over the next decade, two decades, of that coming together, mm. that would create an economically integrated, one hopes freely trading area in which, of course, Beijing would move much more towards the economic center. So I think anyone who believes that more economic prosperity in general is going to be a good thing for the region would wish that particular project well. And it's a question of which direction China will turn, because I don't think these two policies are compatible with each other. You need to have trust with the neighbors, a feeling that the neighbors understand your agenda, that it's transparent, and they're willing to support it. And I think the economic one is going to be much more productive for China than the military in the long term. Korea could be a sort of stone thrown into the pond whose ripples, unfortunately, go in a dangerous direction. I'm often assured by Chinese friends in the know that actually China is often as annoyed by the behavior of North Korea as the rest of the world. And I, I do believe that that's true. Yeah. The problem is that I think it is true that China probably has more ability to pick up the phone and yes. talk to the, uh, the folks in Pyongyang yeah. than is the, uh, the case in, uh, uh, in, in many of the Western countries. Yeah. And I think exercising that diplomacy more actively is going to be a very important token of China's willingness really to create a stable and well-ordered region in yes. which North Korea is obviously at the moment something of a rogue state. Indeed so. One final question for you, uh, Rana, the uh, role of this centre, which and it's very interesting that here you have a, a modern, beautiful building <laughs> set in one of the colleges of Oxford University, St. Hugh's College, uh, specialising in the study of China. What do you think its role is looking forward? I think it's a very good question, actually, Dennis. I mean, you're right that we have a very wide range and also a great deal of depth here. But I think we all actually have one very central idea that drives us, which is that we want to make the centre, which is the biggest single centre for the study of China anywhere in Europe, and one of the biggest in the world. I mean, it has, as well as the wonderful building, which we encourage people to come and see if they're in Oxford, um, but something like 45 permanent staff, academic staff, faculty um, affiliated to it, either physically here or, or very close by. Yeah. Um, and we want to use the teaching and research that they do, which of course is at a very, very high level of quality, not only to continue to produce the finest scholarship on China, and when we say China, we don't just mean modern China, we do everything from ancient yes, philosophy indeed, so. to very contemporary social science, yes. but also to do even more to bring that to the attention of a wider public and private sphere as well. We would like to know that when people who are involved in uh, policy making or perhaps involved in thinking through China's sort of wider place in the world or in business, all of these sorts of areas, that we maybe have something to tell them that they couldn't get simply from you know reading uh, a magazine or uh, uh, perhaps even talking to business people who visited, however distinguished they may be. There's a, there's a depth of knowledge here because of the amount of time and depth of experience we have with China that we think actually is quite hard to match. And it's that distinctiveness that I hope that the centre will bring out. Yes. So in the post-Brexit world, the ministers of the UK government should be beating a path to this door? We've been pleased to see a few friends from government one way or another. I think that's yes. the way I'd, uh, okay. uh, I'd put it, from a variety of parties actually yes. come and visit us over time. Yes. And we very much hope that those conversations uh, grow and continue. Yes. Well, um, Rana Mitter, thank you so much for talking to us with an absolutely fascinating view on China, its attitudes to the world, the way in which its history has influenced the modern China. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure, Dennis. Thank you very much for coming here today.